Okay, so this uh, talk is based on a paper with Sam Gunn, Fermi Ma, and Mark Sandry, entitled Commitments to Quantum States. All right, so commitments are a fundamental tool in classical cryptography. They're basically the digital analog of a locked box. And a sender can commit to some classical message M by sending a commitment, and they can later uh, open to the message by sending an opening. And a commitment should satisfy two key properties, hiding and binding. And hiding says that the commitment reveals nothing about the message M. And binding says that the sender can't change their message after sending the commitment. And they're used in many places and at the foundation of many important protocols. So in this work, we ask the question, is it possible to commit to quantum information? So what I'm asking for is the exact same functionality, but instead of committing to a classical message M, we're committing to a quantum state psi. Okay, and this seems pretty easy. We can just quantum one-time pad our state psi, and because our one-time pad keys are classical, we can just do a classical commitment to those keys. Okay, and this construction is a bit of folklore, but let me just show it. So the sender has some one qubit state psi, and how does she commit to it? Well, she samples two bits, A and B, and some randomness R. To commit, she just applies that one-time pad, control down to A and B, and then uh, sends a commitment to A and B with that randomness R. To open, she just sends A, B, and R. So how does the receiver verify? Well, they just check that the thing that they received in the second round equals the second thing, the thing that they received in the first round if they apply the COM function. And if they do, if, if this check passes, then they'll recover the underlying quantum state by undoing that poly one-time pad. Great, okay. So we should probably ask, is this scheme secure? Does it satisfy hiding and binding? So recall that our intuitive notion of hiding was that the commitment reveals nothing about the state psi. And we can argue about it like this. Well, the commitment hides the underlying bits, A and B. So the poly one-time padded state, x to the a, z to the b psi, actually looks maximally mixed from the, from the receiver's point of view. Cool, so what about binding? Well, recall our intuitive definition of binding, which says that the sender can change the state after sending the commitment. Okay, and we can argue about it like this. So, um, because a commitment, the, under, the underlying classical commitment is binding, then the sender can't change A and B after sending the commitment. And in addition, the sender has also sent away X to the A, Z to the B side to the, sen to the receiver. So the sender can't change how the receiver undoes the poly one-time pad. Okay, but there's one issue here, and it's that when we try to sit down and formalize this proof and write down a proof, um, it's completely unclear what it means to not be able to change a quantum state psi. And I'll talk about this in more detail in just a couple slides, so bear with me. Okay, but let me just take a step back and uh, evaluate our current understanding of quantum state commitments. We have one full core construction, and we have no idea what security means. And that's about it. So in this work, we build a theory for quantum state commitments. So first and foremost, we give a definition for security for quantum state commitments. And we say that uh, QSC is binding if committing to a state psi erases it from the sender's view. And I'll formalize this with a game and also a few slides. Okay, and this definition gives us uh, new constructions for QSCs, and they're actually pretty easy. Um, we build the first succinct quantum state commitment, which allows a sender to commit to an n qubit state using fewer than n qubits in their commitment. And we also formalize the security of the folklore construction. So we prove that it's binding and also hiding. Finally, oh, also uh, as an added bonus, both of these constructions actually don't require one-way functions. We, we know how to construct them from, from one-way functions, but we also know how to construct them from potentially weaker assumptions. Okay, so we're also able to uh, create new applications for quantum state commitments. So if we combine a succinct quantum state commitment with a quantum probabilistically checkable proof, then we get a quantum succinct argument. And this allows a quantum prover to super efficiently verify some statement to a verifier. Okay? Um, so because, uh, because of the PCP theorem, we know that uh, PCPs exist for all of NP. So plugging this in for that that quantum PCP parts, um, we actually get a three message argument for all of MP without one-way functions. Now classically, it's known how to do this using four messages and from CRHFs. 
Um, but we're able to weaken the assumption and reduce the number of messages by using uh, succinct QSCs. And the same protocol extends to all of QMA if the quantum PCP conjecture is true. Okay, and we also have application zero knowledge, which you can see in the paper. Okay, so without further ado, how do we define binding for quantum states? Well, let's recall the classical definition. And the classical definition just says that it's hard for an adversary to send a commitment and then send two openings to two different messages later. Okay, so what happens if we just make things quantum? What happens if we change the message to a quantum message? So instead of M0 and M1, we change it to row zero and row one. And okay, we might expect that the commitment might be quantum now and the opening might be quantum. And okay, well, the adversary should definitely be quantum. So let's just write that definition down. What are some issues that show up with this definition? Well, the first is that the message is quantum. So the challenger can't actually perform this check because for any two arbitrary quantum states, there's no physical procedure to check that they're different. You can do that for pure states using a swap test, but these are, no, these are not necessarily pure states. They could be one part of a larger entangled state, for example. The second problem is that the commitments themselves are quantum. So the challenger is supposed to check that uh, the first opening and the second opening are valid, but uh, because those things are quantum, those measurements might not commute, okay? So as a, as a result of maybe checking the first opening, you might destroy the commitment. And the third problem is that the adversary is quantum. So you, you can imagine a scenario in which um, an, ad an adversary first sends a commitment, commitment for some message row zero, and then they later change their mind and want to open to some message row one. But in doing so, they might destroy the underlying commitment for row zero. Okay, so this type of attack um, should violate our intuitive notion of binding because, they'd be able to because the adversary is able to change their mind, but it doesn't violate this definition of binding because they can't open to both things at the same time. Okay, so a priori, it's not even obvious that a definition is possible. It's not, it's not obvious that it's possible to define binding. But in this work, we give a definition for binding, which we call swap binding. Um, but before I present before I present that exact definition, I need to show some syntax. So how do we formalize a quantum state commitment? Well, in order to commit to a state psi, the sender just initializes some uh, zero, some lambda qubits to the zero state and applies some public unitary com on top of the state. And this will be partitioned into two registers, C and D. Okay, and in order to commit to the state, they just send rho sub C. And in order to decommit or to open, they send rho sub D. I guess in the previous talk, this D was an R. Okay, so what does the receiver do? The receiver just um, applies com dagger and check that's, checks that the last lambda qubits are zero. If they're zero, then the check passes. That means the check passes, and they can recover psi in the remaining registers. And in fact, any quantum state commitment can be written in this form by taking the unitary that a sender applies in the commitment phase and then unitary that they apply in the opening phase and putting them into one. Okay, so here's a syntax for QSC. How do we define binding? Well, informally, our definition just says that after you apply the com unitary, the D register hides the underlying quantum state. So rho sub D hides psi. And this can be both computational or statistical. So if it computationally hides psi, we have security against computationally bounded adversaries. And if it statistically hides psi, then we have security against computationally unbounded adversaries. Okay, but formally, uh, we, route a, we route out a game, and what happens is that an adversary first sends a commitment and an opening, and the challenger would just verify that this commitment and opening are valid. And then what the challenger does is that they do one of two things at random. Either they replace the underlying state with junk, or they do nothing. And then finally, the challenger will return the remaining uh, quantum state on the deregisters back to the adversary. And the adversary has to guess what happened. Did the challenger swap their underlying state with junk, or did they leave it as is? And our definition says that it's hard for a, an adversary to guess this bit B. Okay, so there might be several odd things that jump out to you about this definition, um, but maybe one salient one is that the fact that we're formalizing binding using a distinguishing game. We're formalizing the notion that you can't change the under change a message using using the inability for uh, adversary to guess a bit B. 
So why is that the case? Well, let me just give you a little uh, intuition for that. So re recall this naive quantum definition where the adversary sends a commitment and then two openings, and we had this issue that the challenger can't check that two messages are different. But what we can do instead is we can make the adversary uh, do an, we can we can make the adversary and the challenger perform an interactive proof that convinces the challenger that the underlying messages are indeed different. Okay, so again, here's the problem. Here's a high-level idea. Um, let me just give you a taste of how we turn a distinguishing game or how a distinguishing game comes comes out of uh, comes out of a binding notion. How, no, how, how, how comes out of a notion of binding? Okay, so an adversary wants to convince a challenger that two states are different. What does the challenger do? The challenger randomly returns one of the two states, and if the adversary is able to guess what happened, which state they received, then the challenger can be sure that indeed the two underlying states were different. Okay, and this, I this idea is actually reminiscent from uh, the famous GMW protocol. Okay, so this is swap binding. Uh, just again, it says that the deregister hides the underlying quantum state, and it has some many nice it has many nice properties. But let me just point out one, which is this hiding binding duality. Um, so again, our definition says that the deregister hides a quantum state, and although I didn't define hiding yet, hiding just says that the C register hides a quantum state. So you can imagine that you have a commitment that is statistically hiding and computationally binding. If you just change the two registers, you then get a computationally hiding and statistically binding uh, commitment scheme. Okay, great. So we have a definition. How do we construct new quantum state commitments? So classically, there are these things called uh, succinct commitments, or also known as collision-resistant hash functions. And they allow a sender to commit to a message using a commitment that's much smaller than the message. Okay, so previously I showed you a construction for a quantum state commitment where the the commitment was larger than your underlying message. So can we construct a quantum state commitment where the commitment, where the commitment is actually smaller? OK. Well, this is our, our definition of uh, binding just says that we need to hide our quantum state, or that the deregister hides our quantum state. As cryptographers, we know very well how to do that. All we need is an encryption scheme. So what if we just place uh, the keys for an encryption, C, encryption scheme on the C register? And then encrypt the state on the deregister. And as long as the keys are short, that you know that the size of the keys is smaller than the size of the message, this is a succinct commitment. And we can instantiate this using pseudorandom pallies. Uh, so what we do is um, we, have, we initialize some registers to a uniform superposition over all keys k, and then we apply a pseudorandom pally onto our state onto those keys k uh, onto our state psi. Okay, and this becomes a commitment, and this becomes a decommitment, and that's it. That's our succinct quantum state commitment. So this gives us succinct QSCs from uh, PRGs, but we can actually construct them from potentially weaker assumptions. So we can actually do this using pseudorandom unitaries. Okay, so we have succinct QSCs, but what new applications do we get out of them? Um, so classically, Succinct commit commitments enable things called succinct arguments. And a succinct argument is an, interac an interactive proof, or an interactive protocol between a prover and a verifier, where the prover is trying to convince a verifier of the truth of some statement. But they don't, they're not going to send the entire witness, and, th and in fact, they're going to engage in communication that's much smaller than the size of the witness. Okay, and we know how to do succinct arguments for all of MP due to work by Killian and Macaulay. So how does that protocol work? So say that the prover has a claim that they have some instance X that is satisfiable. Okay, and they have a PCP pi that they want to convince the verif that they have a PCP pi of that fact. So what do they do? Um, so they take a succinct commitment or a CRHF and, they're, and they hash their way up a tree until they get to the very top, which we're gonna call the root. And the prover then is gonna send that root and that root acts as a commitment to the PCP pi. Now, because it's a PCP, the verifier has some checks they can perform on pi. So it's going to ask for some random position Q. And, say, and Q is down here. And what does the prover do? The prover just sends the, the information along the root to leaf path starting from Q. Okay? 
and also the PCP living at Q. The verifier checks that the openings are valid. The way they do that is that they hash the tree up and up and up and up and check that what they got in the opening was consistent. And they finally also do the PCP check. Okay, so this is the classical succinct argument protocol by Killian. And we show a quantum analog of this protocol. So if we combine a succinct quantum state commitment and a quantum PCP for a language L, then we get a quantum succinct argument for that language L. And the protocol is an analog of that, where we replace the Sarah HFs with quantum state commitments. And it's actually inspired by this protocol by Chen Mobisog. Okay, but syntactically very similar. So which languages have quantum PCPs? What can we stick at the bottom of this, of this tree commitment uh, to make this work? So we know that all of MP has PCPs by the PCP theorem. And if the quantum PCP conjecture is true, we can, sit, we can stick a quantum PCP on the bottom. Okay, great. Um, but we actually do this in three messages. And classically, this requires four messages and also requires Sarah HFs. So, but we require weaker assumptions for it. Okay, but the hard part is proving that this protocol is actually secure. So um, how, how, how is the classical protocol proved secure? Well, it's actually done by rewinding. What happens is we suppose we have a classical prover and we want to extract a PCP from that prover. And the way we do that is we run the prover on many random challenges Q and we collect the responses into a PCP. Okay, now if we have a quantum adversary, each time we query the prover, we're going to measure whether the thing we got was correct. That's going to disturb the adversary state. So we also need to repair the prover, but this was um, CMSE showed how to do this. Okay, so how does that procedure work? We're gonna query the prover on some position Q. We're gonna get some response. Then we're gonna rewind and repair the prover. Oops, okay, we're gonna, we, we get the message and we're gonna measure that response. We're gonna record it in our memory. Then we're gonna rewind and repair and do the exact same thing for another position Q. Rewind and repair, do it again. Rewind and repair, do it again. Until we've extracted an entire PCP. But the problem is that for our quantum protocol, the underlying thing on the bottom, this PCP, might be quantum, might be a quantum state. So we can't just measure it and record it, or else we're gonna destroy it. Okay, so how do we extract a quantum PCP? So the idea is something that we call a swap-based rewinding. And instead of measuring the underlying PCP, we just swap it out. And the key insight is that uh, swap binding makes this actually undetectable, almost by definition. So what we do is we initialize some registers to some garbage state, and we do the exact same procedure. We ask for Q, we swap out the messages this time, we rewind and repair, and we swap them out, do it again, swap it out, do it again, and swap it out. Okay, but there's one subtle issue, which is that in CMSE, um, in order for it to work, the root actually needs to be classical. And while that's not the case here because we're using a quantum state commitment and our commitments are actually quantum states. Okay, so this is a subtle point. It's actually the main technical work of our paper. Um, yeah. Okay, great. So um, in summary, um, we give a definition for binding, which says that committing to a state erases it from the sender's view. This definition makes it easy to construct new quantum state commitments. So I gave a construction for succinct QSEs here. And also, we are able to prove this is the security of a quantum succinct argument. Great. Questions? Thanks for the nice talk. Um, I'm a bit uh, confused about um, your construction because um, it uh, just quantum one-time pads um, the committed state, mm -hmm. but um, the quantum one-time pad is uh, malleable, right? So it would appear to me that, um, you know, in the intuitive sense, this should not be binding. Mm -hmm. Basically, for example, if you plug in a computational basis state, um, then you can just apply some Pauli X to the one-time padded version of it, mm -hmm. which results in opening um, a bit flipped 
Yeah, yeah, so that's a, that's a good point. So one thing I didn't say here was how do we verify the commitment? So what's going to happen is the sender is going to send the commitment, but then the receiver has to verify that that commitment was correct. So what happens if you apply a pally X on this D register here is that um, if you undo the commitment unitary, it's not going to pass. In fact, if you apply a pally X, this is going to pass this check, checking that this thing, okay, wait, sorry, let me take a step back. So how do we verify? We, we undo the commitment and check zeros, right? So checking zeros means that we check that this becomes zero after we undo the commitment unitary. But if you apply a pally X here, um, if you undo the commitment unitary, this will no longer be a zero. Okay. Okay. So the, the, the check will just fail, so we know that it was tampered with. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Hi. Um, in your picture, the psi is a pure state, so I was wondering, is this definition good for mixed states? And in that case, what if the, uh, the committer holds a purification? What if the committer holds a purification? Yeah, so, yeah, the exact same construction works for, you do the exact same construction. And actually, our definition um, says nothing about it being a pure state, right? And also, what was the second, what was the last part of your question? Oh, okay, I'm just trying to think of attacks if, if like, if it's a happy PR pair, for instance. But, sorry, what was that? Oh, if the message is a happy PR pair. Oh, if it's half an EPR pair. Um, so, what we can say about the scenario is that they can't change the, the, if you commit to half an EPR pair, then you can't change the underlying state of the second half of the EPR pair. But the center could hold the other half of the EPR pair, and that's fine. But they'll remain entangled. Thank you. Thank you. This was a, I liked your talk. And it's great to see that you could formalize these succinct arguments. Um, I wanted to ask you about the relationship of this work and quantum Merkle trees. Yeah. And solve the open problems in there. For example, um, proving the security with respect to the horror random oracle. Yeah. Can you say a few words? Yeah. So, so we had a bunch of open problems. I wonder. You know. Yeah, it's a good question. Does the like if you apply a hard random unitary on top of a quantum state and you okay, so in that paper what happens is you have some quantum state and you apply a hard random unitary on top of it, and then you pick off some part of it and that becomes a commitment and the other part becomes a decommitment. Um, I don't think I've looked at this formally, um, but I think it could be made to work. I don't know what the exact answer might be. Still open, huh? Yeah. I see. I see. I see. So any of the open problems, we had a bunch of open problems in that paper. Any of them has been? Can you, can you say some? I, I, don't, I don't remember them. Yeah, OK. So the problem is no. <laughs> but thanks. So the last part, it seems that somehow you're proving extractability of um, no, okay, it's not of the, about the commitment, right? It's extractability of the witness, the underlying witness in, in your protocol. Yeah. But could you think that you could tweak your commitment scheme to be extractable as well? Wait, sorry, can you say that again? The commitment scheme, instead of just having binding, to have extractability as well. Like a security property called extractability? Yeah, simulation security. I'm not sure. Sorry, maybe we can talk offline. Hi, thanks for the talk. So I was just a little confused about your assumptions. You said you don't need one-way functions for these. Yep. Okay, um, how are you getting these pseudo-random poorlies? Like, what is that coming from, if not one-way? Yeah, so sorry if that was confusing. Um, so, yes. So this definition uses PRGs, so that's okay. one-way functions. Okay. Um, I guess I was just saying that uh, we know how to do this. If we replace uh, the pseudo-random pallies with a pseudo-random unitary instead, mm -hmm. so like U sub K instead, yeah. Um, we also get security. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah, and there's a there's a known oracle separation between pure use okay. and one-way functions. Okay, I see. Okay, that makes sense. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I I was just uh, I have not one more question. So I I was wondering. Um, 
whether you had thought about interactive commitments, because in the classical setting, interactive commitments for one reason or another are um, interesting to, uh, yeah. to consider. Yeah. Um, so I'll say two things about that. Um, it's hard to define a security for an interactive commitment, and we thought about this. But you can turn any interactive commitment into a non-interactive commitment. So, although, so if you give me a construction for an interactive commitment, I can say to you that oh, I can turn that commitment into a non-interactive one and prove security of that one. But uh, defining security of an interactive commitment is not so straightforward, I think. Okay, uh, let's thank Nathan again. <laughs>